started with principle number three, right? Three? Yes. Okay, we said that God has no body, no shape, no form, no physical idea to it, no substance, anything in the world, even though it is not a physical, there is a physical representation of it, right? Sound goes in waves, right? This is the way it works. Even x-rays or ultraviolet, whatever you want to call them, you cannot really see them, but you, through machines, you're able to know where they are or where they're not, and therefore there is something physical to it. Because what does physical means? You're able to signal it, you're able to say you're here, you're not. Things are in different places at the same time, and therefore you're able to count them, right? So we said, if God would be physical, first of all, there would have, there, you could say there's more than one, and then what's the beauty of it? If you would have a limited God, then who wants a limited God, right? The fact that he's one makes it that he's unlimited, powerful, because he's nowhere, being that he's no, not nowhere, but like being that you cannot say where he is or where he's not or whatever you want, because you cannot count him, then he's just everything, everywhere. Everything is God, right? So we said lots of things, and then I ask you a very big question, right? This is where we finish, and we said like this, okay? According to the Baal, the Baal Atania, the first Rebbe of Lubavitch, right? What did he say? That all of the world is filled with God, right? All of the superior worlds, inferior worlds, everything is filled with God. Because we ask this very big question, is God really everywhere? So there's a big question. Because we know, for example, that when you enter a place that it's, you know, impure, you can't mention God's names because you cannot just like, God is not in the toilet, right? But from the other side, how can you have any place that it's devoid of God? Because being devoid of God would be saying that God is limited because he's not there. So how do we understand it, right? Like my student that said to his, her teacher, is Hashem really truly everywhere? How is God in the toilet, right? So now you're going to understand this. And what I'm going to tell you, it's huge. So from one side, what does the Baal Atania says? God fills the entire world, the superior worlds and the inferior worlds. By the way, I'm telling you the exact quote, because in the verbs, there's a few things that if you notice, changes everything. From the other side, what does the Vilna Gaon says? The Vilna Gaon says, right? Whoever thinks that God is in the most mundane things, how could he even be saying this? How could you say that God fills the entire world and he's in mundane things like the bathroom? That's a total insult to God, yes? So this is like, you know, apart from a big discussion between Hasidim and Magdim or Ashkenazi, whatever you want to call it, it's a very big discussion in like thoughts. But what did we say? In Judaism, whatever the rabbis say, if it's like a real deal, right, specifically from these generations and from generations before, this and these are the words of God. How could it be if they contradict each other? So I always say, and I'm not gonna teach you this right now, but Judaism is always compared in a certain sense lots of things to a circle. In a circle, the beauty of a circle, right? And Nicole will teach you everything about geometric figures later. The beauty of a circle is that any point in the circumference is equidistant to a center, right? You know what it also makes it? It makes it an amazing thing. Any point in that circumference could be any other point. It depends how the circle is rolling, you know? Meaning, it's huge when you think about this, the point over here is exactly the same as the point over here, even though they're completely opposite to each other. Because when the circle goes like this, this point is gonna be there, and this point is gonna be here, right? That's Judaism, everything works, even when they're opposite to each other. How? Because they're all trying to reach a center. This is why, right? The Torah says that till Mashiach comes, we will not know what it is that it, it is, but we're always right. How could it be we're right? Because you could get to a center from many points, right? Maybe there was a point that got like, no, but you could get to a center from any single point. This is the way it works. So now, how could you have two complete opposite ideas? From one side, what does the Baal Atania says? God fills the entire world. Everyone heard that verb? Because that's important verb. What did I say? Did I say God is? Fills, yeah? You heard that? Okay, I'm gonna explain. From the other side, what does the Milna Gaon says? Whoever says that God is in every single place, he's a heretic. Because how could you say that God is in everything that's mundane? So now let's understand this. Where is God? So now let me give you an answer. God is nowhere. What do we mean by that? To be somewhere means that you're occupying space. You're physical. Isn't that true? Right? This is why we did the whole philosophy. The only reason why you're able to say that something is somewhere it's because it is physical. It is bound by time, right? And therefore, we said, we make a very, very big mistake of saying, of putting physical attributes to God. 
Where is God? God is nowhere. But God is everywhere. But God is nowhere in a sense of like you cannot find him in a specific place. Or you cannot say that he's somewhere and not somewhere else. Because that is time, space, dimension. God is nowhere, but everywhere at the same time. So now, how do we still understand this? Let's go into it. The Vilna Gaon says, right, and the Baal at the end of the day, they're saying the same thing. Whenever we learn Torah, we always say like this, that where is God, God's presence, where can you find it? You say, Melo, is this how you write Melo, Binyamin? Great. Melo kol ha'aretz kevodo. Okay, let me translate this for you. You have to get this quote. God, right? What did I say was the verb? Fills. God fills the entire world with his honor. Yes, everyone got that? God fills the entire world with, the, with his honor. What does it mean with his honor? Right, because this is a very, very big question. God fills the entire world with his honor. What does honor mean? When you honor someone, what, what does it mean to honor someone? What does it mean that someone has honor? Give me any synonyms, any ideas that come to your head, right? Accomplished. Accomplished. Yes, I mean, you honor someone when someone is accomplished. But let's just say it like this. When you give kavod to someone, when someone deserves kavod, what does kavod mean, right? Respect. Respect, huge. Does everyone get this? Right, what else? When you honor someone, it causes something in you when you're by them, right? A certain feeling. What feeling? It's a good feeling. Oh, great. Does everyone feel? You're humbled. What else? A good type of fear, yes? If you honor someone, if you reach, look up to someone, which automatically means you honor someone, does that fill you with respect or fear in front of them? Yes or no? Yes. Do you necessarily need to be completely in front of them in order to behave in this way? Or if you would know that they know what you're doing, would you automatically also behave in that way? Yes. yes. You hear that? That's huge. Let's go into this, right? Everyone heard what I just said? Because this is huge. Where is God? God is everywhere and nowhere at the same time. What do I mean? God exists and knows everything that happens everywhere. But he is not necessarily making himself be felt in the same way everywhere. What do I mean by that? I'm going to give you this mashal. Now, this mashal works almost perfectly, but has a little lackings, because obviously I'm trying to explain a God concept with human concept, but it works almost perfectly. By the way, the Torah says that one of the reasons why God lets technology advance so much is because technology allows you to understand God much better. You ever thought about it? Like for the longest time in Judaism, we always teach everything that you do, God listens to, everything that you do, God sees, and you're like, it's so hard for you to understand this concept of like God listens and hears everything you're doing, yes? But then suddenly you have something called Google Earth, right? You know what's Google Earth? You could reach in the computer any point in the, in the world, right? And you could see pictures of like cars that were parked in a certain street because of Google Earth. Isn't that amazing? You know, like what does technology do? Technology is amazing, but apart from all the bad, good things that it does, it allows you to understand God better. Because what do you learn with technology? You can actually have somewhere, someone being somewhere without being there. You know through what? There's something called cameras. You ever thought about that? That works. Someone could be everywhere, everywhere at the same time without being nowhere at the same time, right? Let's say you have a store, okay? And you have cameras in each single place in the store. Again, it almost works, but there's one little lacking. I'm gonna tell you what's lacking in one second. And you have a manager that's sitting in the room with the videos recording every single room of the store at the same time. Is he everywhere at the same time? So technically, this is the little lacking. You cannot actually see every video at the same time because you're going to miss some details. But now let's say that guy is really good. Can you technically be in every single place at the same time without ever being in any place at the same time? Yes? That's exactly what it means. God fills the world with his honor. The Torah didn't choose to tell you God is, because God is nowhere. That would mean he occupies space. 
but the whole world is filled with his honor. What does God's honor mean? You could feel his presence. But by the way, honor depends on something amazing. And this is very important for you to know. If I don't understand your greatness, then I don't have awe of you. I don't have fear of you. Yes, I don't have respect of you. If right now there was someone very important standing in this room, and you see them, but you have no idea they're important, right? Does that affect your behavior? No. If you have no idea who they are, does that affect your behavior? You hear this? This is amazing. God is really everywhere, but he's really everywhere that his honor is. Meaning, wherever he's recognized, wherever people know of God's existence and what God is. You understand that? That is huge. This is why there's a famous pasuk in, uh, in our prayers. We say this every day, and you say like this. In any place that you call my name, I'm going to come to you and bless you. This is what God says. In any place that you say my name, I'm going to come to you and bless you. When you look at this pasuk for the first time, you're like, wait, so if I don't say your name, you're not coming to me? It means like God was not there, but now he is. You heard this? Because if I'm going to say his name, he's coming. But no, God was always there. But because you didn't say his name, you didn't recognize that he was there. And once you say his name, being that your awareness of God just changed, being that your understanding of what God is and it's not just changed, it's as if now he's just here, right? Because if someone really important would be here, but you don't know who they are, you would be doing whatever you want. And the moment someone says, hello, this is this, you'd be like, oh, hi, did you remember me? I am da, 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 da. I'm perfectly. What change? Nothing changed in the room. Your perception changed. Your understanding changed. That's exactly the same thing that happens with God. And this is why when we speak about where God is, we said he fills the world with his honor. But honor is not only dependent on God. Honor is really dependent on you. Because it depends on how do you perceive God. God is everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Nowhere if you don't want to see God. Everywhere if you want to see God, right? And this is a very famous concept in Judaism, that if you stay in this class till we reach principle number 10, yay, you'll get to learn. And if you don't stay, too bad for you, because you'll miss some good stuff, right? But this is why we call in Judaism ashgaha klali, or prati, right? You ever heard these words? What does Ashgaha Pratiklali mean? And really, if I would teach all of the depth of this, you would be, but I'm not teaching this yet. It means divine, general supervision, okay? Or individual supervision, right? But the word Ashgaha means supervision. Until I thought of that example of the store, I never knew why they call it supervision. But then I really got it, because what's the job of a supervisor? He knows everything that's going on everywhere. By the way, you know what else is? Go back to the example of the camera. Even if you could say, OK, the supervisor is not everywhere at the same time, once it is in the camera, then you're still behaving in a way that is honorful, in a way that represents fear. Why? Because the camera means it could be seen at any time in life. You understand? So even if it would fail a little bit, that mashal, that metaphor, it still works perfectly. Because once it's in the camera, it's there forever. It is there, right? God has something called divine supervision. You know what happens with a supervisor? He's everywhere but nowhere at the same time. But now, how do you make it that the supervisor goes to where you are when you're a good, you know, either when you're doing something wrong in the store, he's going to appear suddenly, or when you're doing something good in the store and then he's going to invite you there. Is that the way it works? Same thing by us, right? God supervises the entire world. He looks at everything from above but he only makes himself totally apparent, meaning you could totally just talk to him in your own way, right? Or totally just feel him once you need to, or once he wants you to see him. You understand? That's either by sending you a wake-up call, which also depends on your ability to see, or by sending you something that you're like, wow, what a miracle, and it's just like a beautiful thing that just happened to you in your life, and you're like, wow, this is God. But it is because you were such a good store representative that God gives you a gift. The amount of God that you'll see in your life is totally dependent on the amount of God you want to see. This is the way it works, right? There was a famous Rebbe called the Rebbe of Kotz. One time someone asked him, when he was seven years old, where is God? You know what he answered? God is where you let him in. You know, there's a famous saying from the Hasidic Rebbe, which again, it's funny because this is from the Balatanya. 
They said that the, not even a leaf from a tree falls without God's supervision. Yes? So the other side, the Litaim say, why? You really think God is involved in every single leaf that falls? Like, really? What is that? You think God is involved directly on every single leaf that falls? Of course not. You know, what's the whole concept of, like, did you ever heard this? Countries are managed by different angels. Nations are managed by different angels. Only Jewish people are managed directly by God. You ever heard this? Right? You know, every, every nation has its angel that does God's will. But it's not like that a nation is directly managed by God. So now how do you work these two things? Because from one side, not even the leaf of a tree falls without God. Yes? From the other side, God has messengers and angels that take care of certain things. Right? Because by the way, the Torah does teach us, coming back to the example of the leaf, right? That for every leaf of grass that grows, there's an angel that says to it, grow. So again, is it God or is it the angel? You know what changes? Let me tell you. Imagine, right, I send you a gift, okay? And you have no idea I sent you the gift. You got the gift, you have no idea I sent you, right? Did you get the gift? Yes. Are you happy? Yes, right? But you don't know I sent it. Okay. But now imagine I sent you the same gift, but you know I sent it. Is the outcome the same exact thing? You got the gift? Yes. What change? Recognizing the giver of the gift. Someone that is looking for God will see God in everything. Someone that is not looking for God will still have the same exact things that are going on in your life, but obviously without God, they're not that good, right? But being that you don't see the sources as if God wasn't there. What change? You didn't track it down. If I have money in the bank, and I do not know I have money in the bank, do I have money in the bank? Technically, yes. Practically, no. Can I live my whole entire life without ever using a dollar from that money? Yes. This, this could happen to lots of people. Why? Because they didn't search for the money in the bank. You hear this? Crazy, right? But now, if I am constantly looking at my bank account, right, will I ever find that money in the bank? Yes. The money in the bank did not change. What changed was my search. What changed was my effort in it? You understand that's exactly your life with God. God is always there. But if I choose to just stay, you know, stable and never notice anything and just keep on going and like this is the matzah and that's it, I have money in the bank and I just never notice it. But if I choose to go back and see, then I'll get to a money in the bank. Really, did I end up with this guy in the train just because he takes the train every day? Yes. It could also be he's your husband. Okay, this is not a good example because please don't go talk to every man you meet on the train, right? Except if he's good looking. Okay, but it could be this is your husband. You ever heard all of these stories of like people that end up marrying each other and they've known each other their whole lives? How did this happen? They never even seen it. There are people that actually live in the same street, got married, they never even knew they were neighbors. Why? Because sometimes you just go through life without being aware of anything that's going on in life. And therefore you don't open up your eyes, you don't even notice. Meaning God fills the entire world with his honor, but what really depends on you is understanding who God is. This is why you have principle one and principle two. Because you won't see God unless you first have an idea of who God is. As I always say, the normal sound that your fridge makes, you never notice, because you're so used to it. When do you notice the sound? When it suddenly starts making a new sound. That's God. Suddenly coming into your life, that's the manager suddenly visiting your job. You understand? But really, the manager was always there. You only noticed when he came close to you. But he was always there. You understand? So now, God will almost never interfere in your life or come and just be like, what's up, I'm going. Okay? Unless you call his name. Whenever you call my name, I'm going to come and bless you. That's because you're inviting him in. So God says, oh, so you want to have a cup of tea with me? So I'm coming. Or unless... God sees that you're doing really, really bad. And you really need like some good spanking, like on the good way of like, you know, wake up. And then he's also going to come in. But generally speaking, this is not really going to happen so much. By the way, if you understand this, this changes a lot of things in your life. And I, I could be saying tons of things in your life, but let me go idea by idea. This is why, by the way, you know, a lot of people say that who was the first Jew? We all know this, Abraham. Most people say, why was Abraham the first Jew? Because he found God. True but not true. Lots of people believed in God. What, what was it that Abraham did that was so special? Yeah? 
So we know that what was the mitzvah that Abraham introduced into the world? Does anyone know this? Yes, but I mean, there was chesed. But meaning, through which mitzvah did he did the chesed? He did a specific mitzvah. Anyone knows? Uh, Having guests, yes. Everyone here? But what did he make his guests do? This is a special mitzvah. Ah? Beautiful. Abraham introduced a mitzvah called Birkat Hamazon. Did anyone know this? All of the guests would come into Abraham's house. He would feed them, and most people just think, oh, because he was cute. No. The word chesed means to see something as part of myself. Abraham saw everyone as part of himself. He wanted to introduce them into his house so that they would get to know God. So at the end, he would say, okay, so either you pay me or you bless God. And everyone would be like, who's this God guy? So Abraham would explain to him, you know, the whole 13 principles of faith, and then they would all be believers, you know. And then I met Abraham, chun, 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 chun. Now I am a believer, okay. <laughs> I ran out of like one note, but it was almost good, okay. And then everyone would believe in God. The mitzvah that he introduced in the world was Birkat Amazon. So now for the longest time, I always had issues with blessings. I'll tell you why, because the language of a blessing doesn't really make sense to me. Whenever you say a blessing, and by the way, all of the blessings are included in the Birkat Amazon, because this is the blessing that it's obligated from the Torah, yes? We actually have it on this week's parsha. Oh, so nice, right? It is in this week's parsha because we talk about Bikurim. So when you're going to come to a land of Israel, you're going to get lots of food, and then you're going to bless God and be satisfied. Great. The blessing of Birkat Amazon is this week's parsha. It appears. Parasha Kitavo. So you don't think I don't know the parasha? Right, and it says, Be'achalta, Be'sabata, Uberachta. You shall eat, be satisfied, and bless God. Now, if you ever say a blessing, right, Birkat Amazon, how do you start the Birkat Amazon? I don't know the Ashkenazi song. I'm still learning it. Okay? But you say like this. Blessed are you, God, the creator of the world that feeds the entire world. Right? And when you say this, you should stop and you should say, wait, I'm blessing God? Who am I to bless God? But that, by the way, that, that's what you say in every single blessing. You are blessing God. So what do most people say? You're tracking the source. You're not blessing God, but rather you're tracking the source of the blessing. And that's a beautiful idea, and that is true, okay? You are tracking the source, but you're still blessing God. So how are you blessing God, right? The Torah says that whoever eats and doesn't say a blessing is as if you're stealing from God. So most people think it's because God owns all the apples and you didn't ask him for permission. No, that's not how it works. God made all of the apples for you. You understand? Like your mom buys... Junk food is for you. You should ask permission because you're cute, but like, it's for you. So God made all of the world for me. So it's sort of my stuff. So how am I stealing from God? Everyone hears this? Yes? Yes. So how do we understand this? So I'm going to tell you a very important idea that it's ex specifically expressing what I'm saying right now. Even God, even though, you remember where is God? God is everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So now let me give you a nicer phrase to express this. Even though God is everywhere, godliness is not. You heard this? Even though God is everywhere, godliness is not. You know what's the difference between God and godliness? God is God, his presence. Godliness is the way you feel his presence. Godliness is not everywhere. Not everywhere do we feel God. Not everywhere is the concept of God concrete. Do we feel it? Do we understand it? Right? You could go to millions of places that they don't even know God exists. Millions of places that they behave as if God doesn't exist. Right? Millions of places. So now, what happens? The purpose of Jewish people as chosen people, right? It doesn't mean I'm going to sit and drink piña colada and whatever, right? Chosen means we have a responsibility of making God's presence be felt in the world. Now, if you study the Midrash, it's quite amazing. You'll see this in the Torah. When God created the world, his presence was completely felt. It was as if there was only godliness. This is why the first day of creation, it is called Yom Echad, the day one. It is not the first day, it's day one. Why? Because there was only God. You could feel God in every day, right? It was as if God didn't have any layers on top of his light, no refracted light. You could feel completely God, pure light, right? But then what happened? God knew we were not going to be able to exist like this because we're going to go blind. So he started like putting his light away, right? And then what happened? It seems to be that people started sinning. 
So the Torah says that there were seven, ten generations of people that sing, whatever you want. And with each one of these generations, God said, oh, you don't want me? Fine, I'm going to step away. Oh, you don't want me? I'm going to step away. You don't want me? I'm going to step away. And suddenly, righteous people started coming in, like Abraham, right? And what happened? Abraham, the Midrash says literally like this, said, God, I want you. So God stepped in. God, I want you. Stepped in. And there were seven people, whatever, that brought back God into a world until at the time of the giving the Torah, the light of God was completely felt just as it was before the creation of the world. You hear this? Mm -hmm. So now, what is it telling you? God didn't change. God is still the same, right? What changed was the amount of God he allowed you to feel based on, this is the important point, what you wanted to feel. You understand? Mm -hmm. Meaning, this is how God works. God contracts. We said on the principle number one, God contracts himself and expands himself. God will contract or expand according to your demand. But really, God never changed. It is just that either he puts more light or he, takes, he puts more layers and he allows you to see him or not based on what you want to see. So now coming back to Abraham, what did Abraham say? God, I want to see you. So what did he introduce into a world? Birkat Amazon. What is the whole point of Birkat Amazon? Hey, there's a God. He makes everything. That's exactly what he introduced. You know how you're blessing God? Huge. Our rabbis teach us that a blessing, it's an influence that causes success. You hear that? It's an influence that causes success. It's like in chemistry. You have certain things that would cause specific reactions. That's a blessing. When you go to get a blessing from a rabbi that you should get married, does that mean you're going to get married? No. But let's say I have a quota of prayers or holiness I need to get in order to get married. Let's say it works like that. You have a quota, okay? The more rabbis I go to, yes? Or the more blessings I say or the more prayers I say, is that filling my cup more quickly? Yes. Is that causing me to get there? It's causing me to get there quicker. It's causing me to have success in that, right? Apart from the fact, the fact that I go to a rabbi for a blessing means I fear rabbis. My fear of God, it's increased. My holiness will also be increased because no one's going to go to a rabbi unless like, you believe in God, right, or whatever. And therefore, my whole self, it's increased in a way that now I'm in a place that I could get to what I want. So now, why is a blessing? It causes success. When you're blessing, you're causing God to be successful. How do you understand this? So let's go back. What does it mean to be the chosen people? So we always say, this is Mechina, this is everything. The only one thing you could do for God that he cannot do for himself, it's invite him into the world. From the moment God created himself, he hid, he contracted, and he said, even though I want to be everywhere and involved in your life, it depends on you. You need to want me because this is a relationship. And therefore, the only one thing you could do for God is invite him into a world. Who does it depend how much of God we're going to see? Jewish people, right? This is why whoever came to my Mechina class, when I thought about Shabbat, I said, if all of the Jewish people of the world would keep Shabbat, Mashiach would come, yes? And I said, if you really hear that in between the lines, it means that the only mitzvah that could bring Mashiach is Shabbat. Not tenyut, not hair covering, no, no speaking Lashonara. The only mitzvah in the world that could bring Shab God, that could bring Mashiach, sorry. And by the way, what's Mashiach? Mashiach is a state that you fully feel God, yes? It's Shabbat. Now, why Shabbat? Because if you ever think about it, what are you doing Shabbat? There's nothing except for me and God. We're dating. We're one. I don't even think about shopping. I mean, I, people do, but like, you shouldn't, right? I don't even talk about going in the car because all of that is not godly. All of that is physical. It takes away, it distracts me from what God is. If all of the Jewish people in the world would be keeping Shabbat, our presence of God, our understanding, our allowing of God into his world would be in the maximum. That's exactly what Mashiach is. You feel God's presence. Godliness, it's to the maximum ability it could be. This is why when Mashiach comes, it's not going to be yet Because what did we say was evil? Lack of light. Yes, everyone hears this. Everything works together, right? So what are you doing when you're saying a blessing? You're inviting God into a world. Not only are you inviting God into a world, you're inviting people to see God. You know? By the way, this is why you're going to notice that when you become from, a very hard thing to do is to say your blessings out loud in front of like non-Jewish people. You go like this. 
Why? Because you don't want people to think you're crazy, right? But this is, you know, Rabat Chakoski, at the end of the year, he always does, used to do this banquet. He used to give you advice on how to stay strong. His advice was always say blessings out loud. This is one of his advice. So one point I stopped and I said, why? So first of all, I understood it helps you with the embarrassment, right? You're always embarrassed. But second of all, the more you say blessings out loud, the more that you make a, re a, rea God a reality, not only for yourself, but also for the world, but also for everyone else, because everyone else is going to understand there's someone you're thinking to. Wait, there is this concept called God. And you know what you're doing? You're making God popular. You understand? God becomes a popular kid. Kind of, uh, you know, like, without comparison, but God becomes a popular kid. That's what Abraham did. It is not that Abraham was the first one to believe in God. None of these two yet. Abraham was the first one to understand that our job is to make God popular in the world. And that's what it means to be chosen. It means that I am the ambassador of God, I represent God in this world, and obviously it is not for me to believe in God just myself. I have to help other people also believe in God because God's greatness, in a certain sense, again, God's greatness doesn't depend on anyone because God is who God is, right? But in a certain sense, it depends on the people that recognize him. Because what does the Gemara says? Ein melech veloam. You can have no king without a nation. It doesn't work. Like, God is what God is. But if no one recognizes God, again, in our terms, not in like God, it takes away from God. It's as if he was, you know, Fidel Castro. He's very powerful, but like, what, you understand? But the more people recognize God, the more God's greatness is all over the place. You understand? Because it's not just a concept. It's something that is. It's a reality. This is, by the way, what we're doing in Rosh Hashanah. We're crowning God. What, God needs me to put a crown on his head? Yes, he does, in a certain sense. Because unless we all believe in God, God is king by his own, not because you made him. And that changes everything. That is not a relationship. That's not a real kingdom. That's not democracy, whatever you want to call it. That's dictatorship. That's exactly what you're doing in Rosh Hashanah. And therefore, when you don't say a blessing, you steal from God. You know what you're stealing from God? You're stealing from God his ability to be in this world. You're stealing from God his greatness. This is what you're stealing, because you're not recognizing God. So you're saying, maybe this apple comes from me. Maybe this apple comes from this farm. There's no God to be found. And therefore, you're stealing the ability to track the source and to see God in every single thing. And therefore, how does this work? You hear what I'm saying? Because this is like huge. You understand? And therefore, God is everywhere or anywhere, but it really depends on you. This is why, by the way, I want to tell you something that is very important. Whenever we talk about fear of God, right, and a very big level you should get to, we usually never say irat Hashem, but rather irat shamay. You ever heard this? You ever noticed this? The greatest level of fear you could get to is irat shamay, fear of heaven. Why is it fear of heaven and not fear of God? That's interesting. You know why? Because fear of God depends on your ability to recognize God. Now, even though they mean the same thing, the way you perceive it is completely different. Some of us will only behave as long as we have the person in town. If I have that important person in the room, I'm going to behave well. But if he's outside, I'm not going to behave well, even when I'm being filmed. We know this, right? Because it's not a concrete thing for me. It's not an actuality, right? And therefore, fear of God in other words, again, it is the same thing because at the end of the day, you're always fearing God. But in a certain sense, you know, by the way, the Torah says, oh, I have to teach you this whole thing. Okay, I'll just teach it next time because it's very deep and I want to be able to give you the whole idea, okay? You remind me, we're in fear of God and remind me the name Bilam. You get this? Bilam, fear of God, Bilam. Okay, any questions till now? You heard what I just tell you? This was a bomb. Bomb of principle three. But then I'll get into divine supervision at some point. Sorry I started the idea and I didn't finish it, but that's life. Okay, great. No questions? Mm -hmm.